Good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, Terra Firma Chambers webinar. Uh, my name is Fred McIntosh, and I'm going to be chairing this session today with my colleagues, uh, Mark Lazarovich and Robert Sutherland. Our topic today is community right to buy an asset transfer. Um, I'm grateful to the large numbers of people who've attended, 93 of you, that's fantastic. Um, this is our new series for this year. We ran a series last year. Uh, we will have uh, future events in 2021 or covering our full range of practice areas, employment, property, planning, judicial review, and other aspects of public law. Um, please contact Emma Kasky Potter if you're not already on our email list so that we, you receive details of future events. There will be a related event uh, on the 18th of March, that's next Thursday, um, which will deal with common, the Common Good Fund. Um, and uh, it will involve uh, talks from Scott Blair and Dennis Garrity, and be chaired by James uh, Finley QC. Now, I want to say before I start, this talk and the next talk, I think are important uh, in this field. Uh, many years ago, I used to be a City of Edinburgh councillor, and I remember how many difficulties uh, Common Good Funds caused us back then. This is an area of developing law, and I'm sure that Robert and Mark uh, in their fields of community right to buy and asset transfer. We'll cover this in some considerable detail. Slides will be emailed out to you at the end of the event uh, and a recording uh, of the event, lucky you, will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. And we're going to have opportunity questions at the end. We've had a couple in by email. You'll find at the bottom of the screen a Q&A button. Please use that to submit questions so I can sort of moderate them. We won't do... Um, uh, we won't do the normal sort of verbal questions. Well, I'll read them out. I'll get a response from Mark or Robert as we go. Uh, and uh, the slides are coming from the speakers. So hopefully with the technology is good to us. We'll now hear from Robert uh, on Community Right to Buy. Robert. Unmute myself. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Fred, for that. Uh, yes, my topic is uh, the community right to buy, and I, I will be covering uh, in my talk today um, what the community rights to buy are, who can do it, um, when they can do it, uh, and uh, a little bit about how the process works. Now, Unmuted again. Uh, right. The what are the community rights to buy? Uh, well, um, you can see uh, on this slide that there are uh, four statutory uh, community rights to buy. Um, I, in fact, I'm only going to be talking about three of them. I'm not going to be talking about the crofting community right to buy, uh, but I will be talking about the other three. Uh, the first of them uh, is uh, the community right to buy under Part Two of the Land Reform. Uh, Act 2003. This is the original community right to buy. Uh, to that uh, have been added the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land in Part A and uh, the community right to buy uh, in respect of it in order to further sustainable development, uh, which is in Part 5 of the Land Reform uh, Scotland Act 2016. Uh, collectively, um, these community rights to buy um, have been referred to as um, the radical community right to buy legislation in Glogan Henderson uh, introduction to law Scotland. Um, I'm personally I'm not sure that they are uh, that radical. Uh, they are uh, restricted in how they operate uh, and uh, there is an awful lot uh, that has to be done in order to uh, be able to uh, actually trigger uh, uh, the right to buy. So uh, I think once you've uh, had a had this introductory talk. If you don't know anything about it already, uh, you can form your own view as to how radical it is or not. Uh, now, again, having difficulty oh, moving the slides. Okay. Um, now, uh, I'm going to start by uh, talking about what the community right to buy is not, it isn't intended to preserve the status quo. It's not intended to stop a landowner from developing their own land. It's not intended to block the development of land by others. And it's not 
intended to prevent other interested parties from purchasing the land. The community right to buy under the 2003 Act Part 2 is a preemptive right to buy. It's not a forced sale of land or a compulsory purchase of land. The landowner must be willing to sell in the first place. Uh, part 3A of the 2003 Act and Part 5 of the 2016 Act are different in that they do allow community bodies to apply to the Scottish ministers for consent to exercise a right to buy land. Where the ministers grant that consent, the community body then has the right to buy the land, even if the owner is not uh, seeking to sell it. Um, more than one body can register an application, but if more than one body wants to proceed with their application, the Scottish ministers will require to choose which application should proceed, and the Scottish ministers may also decide that it's not in the public interest for one application to proceed over any other application. So, what then um, does the community right to buy give? Uh, starting with the uh, original community right to buy uh, in part two, um, this applies to land uh, in respect of which a community interest has been registered. So uh, that's the first point. Um, there's got to be a registered community interest in order to be able to buy. Um, originally, uh, a community interest could only be registered over land outside designated settlements uh, with a population of over 10,000. Uh, that meant that most of urban Scotland was excluded from the scope of the community right to buy. That has been changed and so now it, it applies to the whole of Scotland. Uh, land is not a defined term um, within the legislation, but section 33 contains a definition of what is excluded land. Uh, and that definition is shown in the slide. It is land consisting of a separate tenement, which is owned separately from the land in respect of which it is exigible. That essentially means that it is uh, any type of heritable property uh, which is capable of being uh, owned as a separate tenement. However, um, there are exclusions um, from um, what uh, that covers um, so that um, <coughs> certain uh, from the well the exclusions operate as a double negative uh, which have the effect that uh, certain things uh, are excluded from the exclusion which brings them back in then to the community right to buy um, so uh, salmon fishing uh, and mineral rights are uh, excluded from the exclusion so uh, you can uh, uh, exercise the community right to buy over them um, but uh, out of the mineral rights um, there is a further exclusion for oil, coal, gas, gold or silver so you cannot uh, buy those. Um, other mineral rights are included in the community right to buy. Rights such as the uh, right to gather uh, mussels and oysters uh, are not a separate tenement and would be excluded from the community right to buy. Turning to uh, part 3a uh, and the right to buy there uh, the, uh, the right to buy is in relation to eligible land um, and land is eligible uh, if in the opinion of the ministers it is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected uh, or the use of the management of the land is such that it results in or causes harm directly or indirectly to the environmental well-being of a relevant community. The community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land uh, regulations 2018, uh, which I've put up in the handout, set out the criteria for deciding uh, applications. Um, those criteria relate to the physical condition of the land, the land designations and how land is used or managed. So you need to consider uh, the land designations, for example, is it as a triple SI uh, or does it have any uh, nature conservation status? Is it is the land within a conservation area uh, or it, does it involve a building with a listed building status? You also have to consider the uh, development plans um, uh, with the local development plan and uh, the, the general development plan. Um, important question is how long has the land been in that state? Um, is there a risk to public safety? Um, does the, the existing state of the land have any adverse effect on adjacent land? Uh, other important questions are, uh, for example, is there a statutory nuisance present uh, under the Environmental Protection Act 1990? Um, 
are, have there been any closure notices uh, or other action taken under the Anti-Social Behaviour Scotland Act 2004? Um, there is a definition of harm. Uh, so harm includes uh, the environmental effects uh, of uh, which uh, there is an adverse effect on the lives of persons uh, comprising the relevant community, uh, but it doesn't include harm which in the opinion of ministers is negligible. Um, if land is environmentally detrimental, uh, the community body must ask the relevant regulator, uh, that for example SEPA, uh, to take action to remedy or mitigate the harm. Um, and it must be shown that the harm is unlikely to be removed if, if the owner uh, remains as the owner of the land. Turning then to the uh, right to buy under part five of the 2016 Act, um, this applies to land uh, except excluded land uh, and excluded land uh, includes uh, land where there's a building or structure which is uh, an individual's home, uh, for example, uh, as well as a traditional home. It could also involve uh, a caravan site, um, something like that. Um, also, uh, land of a type mentioned uh, in paragraph A, uh, which the Scottish ministers have specified by um, regulations. Um, and uh, there are regulations, um, 2020 regulations, which do um, specify uh, a number of exclusions, um, such as tied accommodation, other similar types of occupation, uh, life rents, land that falls within the curtilage of a home, um, land used for similar types of use as you would expect from land typically found within the curtilage of a home. And that would include things such as garages, storage areas, garden ground. Um, crop land is also excluded. Um, land which is owned or occupied by the Crown as a result of it having uh, vested uh, bona vacantia in the Crown or where the, it has uh, fallen to the Crown as Um And um, the Scottish ministers also have uh, power uh, to uh, make regulations to give uh, further uh, areas of land, uh, specify further areas of land or classes of land which um, should be excluded. Uh, <clears throat> important to note that part five also includes a, a right to buy um, a tenant's interest uh, in, in the land. Um, so uh, it covers not just the actual ownership of land, but can include tenancies, however certain tenancies are excluded, tenancies of crofts, um, houses and other types of tenancies uh, specified uh, by the Scottish Minister by uh, regulation. So who then um, can exercise the right to buy? Um, it's not just anybody. I can't just turn up and go, um, I think I'm going to do this. You have to be a community body. Um, a community is uh, defined by reference to a postcode unit uh, or uh, postcode units um, uh, and uh, has to be persons um, who are resident in those uh, units or area or entitled to vote uh, in a polling district in, in that area. Uh, and a community body, um, it has to be one of uh, three types of organisation. Uh, originally, it had to be a, a, a company limited by guarantee. Uh, that's now been expanded to also include a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation uh, or a community benefit society. Um, there are further rules which apply to all of these. Uh, I've just set out the rules, roughly speaking, uh, and this doesn't cover all of them, um, applying to companies limited by guarantee to illustrate um, what's involved. Um, you have to obviously have your memorandum and articles of association um, and in other uh, organisations uh, equivalent um, sort of constitutional documents. Uh, and these have to have uh, certain requirements uh, uh, within them, so they, ha they have to contain a definition of the community. Um, there has to be at least 10 members. It used to be 20, that's been reduced. Uh, three quarters uh, of uh, the members uh, have to be members uh, of the community uh, and have uh, control of the company. Scottish ministers do have the power to disapply uh, the minimum required number of members if they consider it as in the public interest to do so. Uh, originally, there was a requirement for audited accounts um, for the limit for the uh, limited company, uh, that has been removed. Um, that was a very onerous burden, um, but there still remains a requirement for proper arrangements for financial management of the company to be in place. Um, a further uh, uh, specialism, specialism in relation to uh, part five of the 2016 Act is that uh, a uh, community body can also nominate a third party uh, body as a purchaser uh, 
if it meets specified uh, requirements. So a nominated third party which meets uh, these requirements is not a community body until the Scottish ministers are given, given written confirmation that they are satisfied. That the main purpose of that body is consistent with furthering the achievement of sustainable development. Um, so uh, turning then to the question of when uh, the community right to buy can be exercised. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, in all cases, you have to have your community body uh, and it has to uh, be on uh, the register. So there are two registers, in fact, under part two of the 2003 Act, the community body has to have registered an interest over the land in the Register of Community Interests in Land, uh, the RCIL. Um, there have been some uh, changes uh, since the original 2003 Act. Uh, these now mean that the community right to buy under Part 3A uh, of the 2003 Act and under Part 5 of the 2016 Act, uh, the community body there has to be registered in a new register uh, called the Register of Applications by Community Bodies to Buy Land. So um, this brings us to a point where, uh, in summary, um, before registration happens, you have to create your community body, you have to define your community, um, you have to uh, have identified your uh, land um, that you want to uh, purchase uh, or acquire, uh, you have to prepare your proposal um, and you have to give some thought uh, as to how that is to be financed. Um, and uh, you also have to obtain community support um, in order to be uh, get on the register. Um, now, in terms of part two of the 2003 Act, um, that is done uh, normally uh, by uh, petition um, and uh, you would uh, normally require to demonstrate at least uh, that 10% uh, of your defined community uh, are in support uh, of your proposal. Um, so as a, you gather a petition of, of names uh, for people within the community to, to show that support. Uh, and uh, evidence of community support uh, must be gathered with, uh, and obtained within six months of the date of application being made uh, to the Scottish Ministers for Registration. Um, because part two is a preemptive right to buy, um, then it operates slightly differently from the other two rights to buy. So under Part 3A uh, of the 2003 Act and Part 5 of the 2016 Act, um, the uh, community support is demonstrated there by actually having a ballot. Uh, the, the ballot um, is where uh, you have to have at least half of the members of the defined community voting. Uh, and if you've got fewer than half of uh, the members of the defined community voting, then the proportion uh, which does vote, it has to be sufficient to uh, justify uh, proceeding to buy the land. And the majority of those who do vote have to have voted in favour of the proposition that the community body uh, buy the land. So that's who can do it. Um, and now turning to uh, how the process works uh, and uh, when it can be done. Um, the registration process um, involves using a prescribed application form. So there are prescribed forms for each of the community rights to buy. Um, the information that uh, has to be put into the form includes uh, details of the community body uh, and the definition of the community body. That has to be both uh, written uh, and in map form. Uh, and I'll come to maps in, in a moment. Uh, details of the land have to be registered, again, both written and mapped, uh, and details of the community's connection of the land have to be described. Uh, who owns the land? Uh, who has any other legally enforceable rights over the land, such as leases or uh, creditors in a standard security? Uh, and uh, what details uh, have been of steps that have been taken by the community uh, body to place the owners and creditors um, of the land? You have to provide uh, details of the community support that has been obtained. You have to have details of the proposals for the land uh, that you want to acquire and details of how the acquisition of land will be compatible with sustainable development. Um, so you've got to set out your the economic, environmental and social benefits of your proposals. And you've got to uh, give the reasons why it is in the public interests for the Scottish ministers to register the interest in land 
There are now uh, regulations um, which uh, give a lot more detail uh, as, or, or which set out the detail as, as to uh, what the application forms are and, and the process. And uh, you'll see the reference there in the slide to Schedule 1, um, which gives specification as to the maps, plans, or other drawings which uh, are to be used uh, as part of the application process. Uh, and um, that shows that the maps uh, have to have a grid reference, a four figure uh, ordnance survey grid reference, usually uh, a north sign, a map scale, uh, the boundary of the land um, uh, and uh, or the community involved uh, as uh, required uh, and an arrow point uh, from the, the map grid reference to the area of land. And it shouldn't be thought that um, these requirements um, can in any way be skipped um, or uh, ignored uh, because um, the result will be that uh, if they're not fully complied with you're like it's likely that the Scottish Minister will um, reject um, the application for registration. A case where uh, there was an error in the maps is Hazel against the Scottish Ministers. Um, this was an appeal against the decision of Scottish Ministers to register the community right to buy under part two. The main issue uh, was whether the applications uh, were incompetent uh, as they did not comply with the community right to buy specification of a plan, Scotland Regulations 2004, put in place at the time. And uh, that was because of a failure to include any Ordnance Survey grid references. Uh, the uh, sheriff held that the omission of the grid references was fatal. Uh, as a result, uh, the Scottish Minister should not have accepted the applications for registration. Uh, and uh, the Keeper was ordered to remove the registrations from the RICL. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the uh, again, because the um, preemptive right to buy under Part 2 um, is, uh, it involves uh, someone who, community body who registers land uh, before uh, somebody wants to get rid of it, um, and uh, the same again in respect of the, the other um, uh, registration processes. Uh, we then have uh, uh, the concept of timeless and late uh, applications for registration. Um, so uh, a timeless application is uh, one where the registration uh, is, uh, application is made uh, before somebody um, is attempting to uh, sell or transfer their interest in land uh, to other people. Uh, and a late application uh, is one um, which comes in after that has happened. So uh, in uh, Home Hill Limited against Scottish Ministers, um, this was uh, the first uh, decision of the court under the uh, part uh, two of the community right to buy uh, process. Uh, the uh, Scottish ministers declined to accept an application for registration that was made after land was marketed for sale. Um, the sheriff um, had to consider what the nature of the appeal against that decision was, uh, and um, he decided uh, that it wasn't an appeal on the merits, uh, which allowed the court to make a fresh decision. Uh, the appeal was more in the nature of a judicial review type exercise, the question being whether the ministers had made a decision that was a lawful and reasonable exercise of their discretion with reference to the policy principles which under uh, lay the act. A necessary component uh, of registration uh, was that a community body had considered the implications of community ownership and had focused uh, on the land in which they did interest. Therefore, it wasn't unreasonable in his view uh, to uh, for the Scottish ministers to expect uh, communities to plan ahead. Uh, and uh, when it came to uh, an awareness of what was happening with the land, um, it wasn't the awareness of uh, individuals uh, in a community body, it's community body organisation itself that was relevant. It was the general awareness of the community um, and uh, the intention uh, to purchase uh, uh, within the, the wider community uh, which required to be considered. Scottish ministers have a policy of only granting applications for registration in exceptional circumstances uh, and uh, the uh, sheriff accepted that that was a legitimate policy uh, and uh, that uh, there had been nothing in the reasons provided to the Scottish ministers uh, 
um, which showed that there had been any serious intention to register a community interest prior to the land coming in the market. And there was not anything amounting to good reasons for the application being made late when considered in light of the policy principle. And the second case on uh, late applications is Coastal Regeneration Alliance Limited. Um, that involved land uh, near Kakenzie Power Station in 2001, where Scottish Power had disposed of the <coughs> areas of land uh, <coughs> back in, <coughs> so back in 2001, uh, but those, uh, uh, that information hadn't appeared on the land register. Um, the, land, the new landowner uh, acquiring from Scottish Power had then entered into talks uh, a number of years later with uh, several third parties with a few to sale of the land. Um, and by early 2015, um, the land was noted in third party uh, development proposals. Um, the Scottish ministers uh, received an application um, which they declined to accept uh, because uh, the landowner had not been correctly identified in, in the original applications. Uh, so revised applications were submitted um, with the correct landowner. Uh, uh, identified um, and the Scottish Minister uh, decided uh, again uh, that uh, they weren't going to uh, allow um, the application for reg they weren't going to grant the application for registration. <laughs> um, and that was because they said that while there was some <laughs> sorry, in, uh, evidence of it, intention um, towards pursuing community ownership of the land, uh, there was um, no indication of uh, a more serious intent to use the community right to buy until after the land had already been um, referred to and plans been put forward by the third party developers. Um, so submitting an application to register an interest uh, as a reaction to the proposed use of land was not a good reason for uh, not submitting a timeless application. The sheriff in that case uh, is, um, reviewed uh, the earlier case of Home Hill uh, and considered that the uh, principles uh, used to decide that case uh, were correct um, and uh, that no relevant basis had been put forward uh, on which the court could exercise its powers to overturn uh, its decisions. Uh, I apologise for the phone uh, ringing behind me. Um, now, after an application uh, for registration has been received, um, the landowner is notified of the registration application at that point, there is a temporary prohibition placed on the landowner or creditor, which prevents them from taking steps to transfer or dispose of the land. Um, the minister will consider uh, any comments submitted when deciding to approve or reject the application. Um, the prohibition uh, on taking steps to transfer land also prevents further marketing of the land. Um, if uh, parties have not yet concluded missives, uh, then they are unable to do so if they're in uh, negotiations over a potential option agreement, uh, but that hasn't yet been finalised, um, then again that uh, can't proceed any further. Uh, it should be noted, however, that uh, not all transfers of land are actually uh, prohibited. Um, so uh, there are uh, exceptions. Um, the exceptions include transfers by way of gift, um, transfers and implement of a court order, uh, with some limited exceptions to that. Um, transfers between spouses or civil partners, an implement of an agreement which had been entered into before the application was made. Uh, transfers between uh, group companies. Uh, transfers to a statutory undertaker uh, or uh, purposes required for their undertaking. Uh, transfers uh, which are made uh, under compulsory purchase hours. Um, transfers involving another exercise of another community right to buy. Um, Transfers and implement of missives which have already been concluded uh, or where an option to acquire has already been created, uh, uh, which uh, happened before uh, the application appeared on the register. Um, the uh, transfers on assumption, death or resignation of a partner uh, in a firm or a trustee in a trust, uh, and uh, also where land is vested in someone else for the purposes of sequestration, bankruptcy, winding up. Um, or you know, the appointment of a judicial factor. After registration has, uh, of the interest uh, has been accepted by the Scottish ministers, uh, then in terms of part two of the 2003 Act, if the landowner intends to transfer the land and requires, then the landowner requires to offer the 
community body the opportunity to purchase the land. If the community body decides to proceed, the Scottish Minister will then appoint and pay for an independent valuer to determine the market value of the land. Following the valuation, the ministers will then appoint and pay for a balloter to ballot uh, the community again. Uh, the balloter has to uh, have been appointed, <coughs> no, sorry, once the balloter has been appointed to the community body, it has to complete a, a form um, under Schedule 10 uh, of the Act, providing all relevant information to, to the balloter. Um, the results uh, will then form part of the right to buy application, along with evidence provided uh, in support of the proposals, uh, such as a business plan uh, or a feasibility study. And a community body has to submit uh, the evidence uh, in terms so another form, Schedule 12, um, if the Scottish ministers uh, give their consent to proceed with the right to buy, the community body will then have eight months uh, from that date uh, with which to proceed with the purchase uh, in order to conclude the transfer of land uh, or uh, a longer period if that's agreed uh, between the community body uh, and the uh, landowner. Under Part 3A uh, of the 2003 Act, Part 5 of the 2016 Act, uh, after registration, uh, the landowner will be asked if they agree uh, to the community body's request to transfer the land to them. If the landowner doesn't respond or doesn't agree to the request, then the community body can apply to the Scottish Ministers for consent to exercise the right to buy. If the consent to exercise the right to buy is granted by the Scottish Ministers, um, the owner must sell that land to the community body um, or uh, the third party purchaser uh, as permitted by part five of the 2016 Act. Um, community body, the owner or the tenant um, uh, all have rights to appeal to uh, the, deci uh, the decision of the Scottish ministers. Um, and again, it should be noted um, all um, sales uh, are at market value uh, or a value which is agreed between the owner and the community body. That's the end of my talk, uh, and now uh, the next speaker is going to be Mark Lazarevich talking about asset transfer. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, and good morning. My talk is on asset transfer, and the asset transfer scheme was introduced by part five of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act in 2015. The basic provisions of the asset transfer scheme are simple. Uh, it gives a community transfer body the right to make a request for an asset transfer to a relevant authority and a wide range of public bodies fall within the scope of that term relevant authority. Uh, the regime for asset transfer is a separate regime from that which uh, my colleague has just been uh, describing and the consequences of this scheme are that it could provide substantial uh, potential for the transfer of public sector assets to community bodies. And to understand the scheme, it's worthwhile recalling that the intention of the Act is radical, as you can see from this quote from the Scottish Parliament report on the matter. The bill aims to give the initiative to communities to identify properties they are interested in and it places a duty on public authorities to agree to request unless they can show reasonable grounds for refusal. And the intention is not for the focus of asset transfer requests to be on buildings and land considered surplus, but on what the community seeks to achieve and what property would help them achieve that. So the first question then is, what is a community transfer body? It's defined in React as a community control body of a body or a class, one within a class of bodies designated as a community transfer body by Scottish ministers. The Scottish ministers have defined bodies which meet the requirement for the community or cropping right to buy as uh, being uh, appropriate bodies uh, to be regarded as community transfer bodies. But in most cases, an application will come from a body which falls in the definition of being a community control body which is the general definition that applies. And that again is defined in React, as we'd expect, section 19. And I'd highlight in particular the provisions which are designed to make clear that the application must come from a body which is genuinely representative of that community. So you will see at B that the majority of the members of the body 
um, have to be members of that community at C, that those members of the community have to control the body, and D, that membership of a body is open to uh, any uh, member of that community. But what is important, and the difference with the land reform uh, provisions, which uh, my colleague just spoke about, is very clear here, is that there is no definition within the asset transfer provisions of what a community is. The guidance, however, does give a, a, a clear uh, description. A community may be it can be any group of people who feel they have something in common. They may live in the same area, so they may come within a geographical community, but they also may share an interest or a characteristic. You can see they can be ethnic, cultural groups, faith groups, uh, those affected by a particular illness, sports clubs, clan heritage associations, whatever. They can even be national or international groups, where there's also provision of a guidance, as you will see, that an authority to whom an application is made should check that even though such large bodies may qualify as community controlled bodies, it will still be necessary to check that they do indeed relate to a defined community and the members of that community have control over that body. So that's the definition of community. So what assets uh, can a community body submit an application for transfer uh, for. Well, asset transfer can be made for land, and land is not just for land itself, but also buildings and structures on the land, land covered with water, any right or interest in or over that land. And it can take, of course, the form of ownership, that's section, uh, subsection A, but it can also be uh, over, it can also be for a request for a lease uh, of the uh, property concerned, and that can apply not just to land which is owned by the relevant authority, but land which itself leases from another organisation. So there's a uh, provision there. And there's also a provision that the transfer request can be for rights in respect of, of land other than ownership or lease. Uh, and the example is given their rights to manage or occupy the land or use it for a purpose specified in request. So to give an example, uh, a Sunday football club could put in a request for a right to use part of a park as a football pitch uh, for a certain period each week. Uh, presumably they only wish to do that if a local authority will not uh, agree uh, to use for that purpose. I should uh, make one point here, however, that there is a distinction drawn in the guidance between a request to take over property to use it for a particular service, and that should be the subject of an asset transfer request. If a community body actually wants to take over an existing service of a local authority, then it is expected to make a participation request, which is a separate scheme set out in the Act, which I won't uh, uh, go into uh, at the time available. Now, although I've said that uh, the community body can put in a request for different types of asset transfer. There is an important point to note when it comes to requests for transfer of ownership. When a request is for a transfer of ownership, then it has to be made by an incorporated body uh, in some way, a company, a Scottish charitable organisation, a community benefit society or other bodies if they're so designated by the Scottish uh, ministers and they also have to have a minimum of 20 members uh, in that organization uh, and that of course uh, is clearly designed at ensuring that when it comes to ownership there should be a certain degree of formality and a certain minimum level of community support but there's no such restriction on leases or other rights and the definition simply requires a written constitution. Obviously, the local authority can request of the authority to request is made, I can uh, uh, take into account the ability of the organization to deliver what it claims it will achieve by an asset transfer. I want to something about the particular question of common good property and how that is affected by the asset transfer regime. And there is no doubt from the guidance, and it's actually guidance not for the asset transfer regime, but actually under the guidance for common good property, 
that a community may request the transfer of common good property as it becomes of interest scheme, but agreement on asset transfer requests will not override existing restrictions, such as requiring the agreement of the courts for disposal when a property concern is classed as inalienable common good property. And those of you familiar with common good property will know that in certain circumstances, you will indeed have to make such requests to the court. I have to say that this uh, definition begs a number uh, of questions. Uh, it's quite easy to see, for example, situations where perhaps a community re asset transfer request was put in by a uh, body which didn't represent a particular local borough within an area for which the uh, from which the common good uh, public had derived, but was maybe another type of community. And it's hard to know how the court would approach trying to reconcile the asset transfer principles with a principle of common good property. Uh, I suspect this may be one of the areas where there's perhaps going to be most litigation and dispute uh, there to uh, see how the new provisions will uh, have an effect. Whose assets can be transferred? It's listed in the Act and the Scottish Government also out of other bodies to the list. It's a uh, very substantial list of organisations, local authorities obviously, but it's not just local authorities, Scottish ministers, health boards, uh, go on, uh, regional transfer partnerships, Scottish Natural Heritage, Scottish Police Authority, which of course includes Police Scotland, Scottish Water, substantial holdings of land and property across Scotland, and others can also be added by the Scottish Government as well, as you can see. In particular, I would draw attention to the provision which allows them to add a publicly owned company, uh, which has to be owned by one of the relevant authorities I've just described. Uh, many local authority or indeed public authority functions are now carried out by various forms of company owned by that authority and indeed the Scottish ministers during the passage of the bill in 2015 said it was a very wish that uh, arms length external organizations should be included within the scope of asset transfer rules in due course but as yet that has not yet happened an important point to emphasize is that the public authorities which can be added to the list of authorities to which a transfer uh, request can be made uh, excludes, of course, UK government departments of agencies, and of course, uh, they, the government cannot add private or voluntary sector organisations to list the bodies to which asset transfer requests can be made. When a community body wants to make an application, it has to provide information on 15 specific points. The list looks fairly onerous uh, when you uh, examine it, but it's important to emphasize, first of all, there are some details which only have to be provided in outline at the initial stage. And secondly, as you will see, the whole philosophy of the Act is that it should be what you might describe as applicant friendly. The applicant should be given the opportunity to correct defects in the application, even if a request is not technically valid then the local office, the relevant authority should explain, for example, why uh, that validity might arise. Obviously, we aim to allow them to cure any such defect. The local authority where an application is made to it is required to consider a number of criteria. As you will see, it's required to consider how the request for asset transfer will uh, have an effect on various socio-economic and environmental objectives. Importantly, it will also be required to consider the benefits from the proposal, but also how such benefits would relate to other relevant matters, including in particular the functions and purposes of the authority. So the effect of these provisions, for example, would be that if the effect of a transfer would be to inhibit the authority to carry out its functions or duties and prevent it from meeting various socio-economic or environmental objectives, it might well be justified in receiving the application. And moreover, the guidance makes clear uh, that in balancing the various criteria, it can also, and indeed it should consider, whether the community body's proposals are practicable and delivered by it. There's no point in having a wonderful proposal if in fact the community body isn't able to be likely to deliver it. But the default position is clear. It must agree, that's the relevant authority, 
must agree to the request unless there are reasonable grounds for refusal. If there is a refusal, uh, then there are opportunities for the agreed body to uh, make an appeal or make a request to review. The situation is different between the circumstances when the application has been made to local authority or to Scottish ministers or to another uh, authority. If it's made to uh, another authority, another of the list of authorities, then the community transfer body concerned can appeal to Scottish ministers who can then deal with the appeal in various ways, which I have set out uh, in the, the slide. If the request would be made to the local authority of the Scottish ministers and the authority of the Scottish ministers refuse it, then the local authority of the Scottish ministers as appropriate must first of all carry out a review. Uh, and in the case of a local authority, if the community transfer body is aggrieved at the decision by the local authority, then the local authority, then the community transfer body has a further right of appeal to the Scottish ministers. There's no right of appeal or review beyond the Scottish ministers, other than, of course, the general right that one might have to seek judicial review if you were of the view that the uh, Scottish ministers had acted unlawfully and how they had dealt with the appeal or review. The Act does not specify the important question of how much should be paid for an asset that is transferred. It's clearly envisaged, however, that transfers may not be at the market price. The relevant authority may decide that these social objectives could justify a price which is uh, below the market price and the uh, guidance reiterates the long-standing principle uh, in local government and public uh, finance that best value does not always mean the highest possible price. It can also be noted however that conditions can be imposed to protect the discount if a transfer is less than the market price. So, for example, if the community body fails to deliver what it promises in its application or uh, chooses to uh, dispose of the property or not comply with the terms on which it has been uh, conveyed uh, to them, then there are various mechanisms that can be set and put in place to protect the discount that's been offered. They can include a right of reversion or a requirement to repay part or all the purchase price, uh, imposing your burdens. Various suggestions are outlined uh, in the guidance. A local, a relevant authority has to uh, publish a register of land uh, showing uh, what uh, land is available, uh, which can be showing its uh, ownership of land, which uh, is therefore available for asset transfer request to be made to it. It's important to note, though, that even though some types of land do not need to be included in the register, uh, it's nevertheless the uh, an application for uh, transfer can be made in respect of any land owned by a relevant authority. It is not the register which determines what is available for asset transfer requests, but is just to uh, assist public uh, community bodies uh, if they wish to know what property they can apply for, but are not restricted in applying to uh, property which is on that register, uh, which is published by the authority. What has been the experience of the asset transfer in practice as so far? Well, it's still relatively early days. The legislation only came into effect over 2017, 2018. There have been a reasonably substantial number of transfers to local authorities as transfer requests made to local authorities. Not many have been made to other relevant authorities as far as I can see. The vast majority of transfers have been undertaken by agreement, in many cases without even a formal asset transfer request being made, sometimes just simply expression of interest being submitted. But that's probably not surprising given that there's been extensive financial support from the Scottish Government to promote asset transfer and the UK government itself has also made some announcements in the budget to provide finance for that. And of course, in many cases, the application has been for a property which the authority is quite happy to dispose of in any event. And you can probably regard the 2015 Act as underpinning the community right to acquire assets. In most cases, the authority will agree to decide uh, to agree with a request or negotiate because it knows that ultimately the community group will be able to rely upon 
the variable favorable provisions of the Act if there is a dispute. But there is certainly the potential for controversy and dispute because of the power that the Act does give to the community groups. Some applications already are rejected, and no doubt in the future, some of these will lead to high profile disputes. Finally, three useful web links which I would uh, recommend, including the guidance for relevant authorities and also a website of the Community Ownership uh, Scotland support group, which has been funded by the Scottish Government to assist and advise on such applications being made. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm gonna, are we going to move to the questions and answer slide? There we are, I'll stop sharing the screen. So we've had seven questions. Thank you, Mark and Robert. Um, I'm always nervous about this part of, the, of, of a seminar, so I'm going to randomly pick questions for Robert first, allow Mark to recover from that. So we've got a couple of anonymous questions, Robert. One of them is, um, is it possible to define a community uh, by anything other than postcodes in terms of community right to buy? And then uh, perhaps you could pick up at the same time, what is meant by an option to acquire, which was in your list of things uh, that uh, can go ahead even if there's been a registration. Just unmute myself now. Um, fine. Uh, thanks, Fred, for those questions. Uh, firstly, uh, is it possible to um, define a community by anything other than a postcode? The answer, brief answer to that is no. Uh, uh, your uh, that's how you work out what your community is um, by, by reference to the, the particular postcode um, or postcodes um, that may be uh, applicable. Um, and uh, the option, uh, what is meant by an option to acquire? Um, what the most typical example would be, uh, for example, comes up in, uh, for example, for housing developers who uh, are interested in acquiring land, um, but they're not going to um, enter into uh, concluded missives for that land uh, until it's clear, for example, that uh, they're going to get planning permission for it. Um, so uh, what they'll do is uh, they will, in, they will uh, enter into an option to acquire, um, often many years in, a, in advance uh, of uh, any likely purchase. Uh, the point being that um, they get first dibs on that land uh, at a future date um, so that uh, if uh, the land then becomes zoned for development um, uh, then they will be able to acquire it uh, exercising uh, the option uh, and exclude other potential purchasers uh, uh, from competing with them. Um, so, so that's essentially how it, the option uh, to acquire uh, operates. I'm going to ask a question for Mark now. So there's a question here about um, uh, uh, if a local authority owned property goes for sale through a local estate agent uh, and receives an offer and subsequently goes to a closing date, can that date be extended? I suppose the question is also who by to allow a community group to lodge an interest. Well, I think the question, I think is. It's perhaps um, better redefined is that uh, if there is a uh, request put in for a property and there is some step taken to dispose of a property uh, by the authority concerned, um, the position there is that uh, although the standard position is that there is a prohibition on disposal once an asset transfer request has been made, there are circumstances in which uh, that disposal can still go ahead, and one of those is if a property has been advertised for sale or if there's been entered in negotiations or whether there has been a, uh, uh, a contract for sale. So in those circumstances, it would normally be the case um, that the uh, asset transfer request um, uh, could still be made, um, but the disposal could go ahead, obviously depending upon the nature of the uh, contract for sale of that property. If a local authority uh, and the purchaser chose to allow the closing date to be uh, um, extended, then the local authority could do that. But in general terms, uh, if there uh, is a disposal underway or a negotiation underway, then the asset transfer request 
would not stop the authority disposing of that property. I suppose a related question, what you've got here from Norman Cunningham, is there a late application for asset transfer as in community right to buy? Um, well, there's no specific uh, provision for a late application. Uh, as far as I understand, an application can still be made. It's just that uh, uh, there would be uh, no um, prohibition on disposal. I can also um, say that the Scottish B Act also gives the Scottish Government powers to disapply the prohibition on disposal uh, if it chooses to do so, presumably because it is concerned about the greater public interest. So, um, uh, uh, and, and equally, um, it can also uh, um, requ uh, require that the uh, disposal is uh, not uh, prevented by uh, such a uh, ongoing negotiation. But essentially, there's no specific different provision. Thank you. Robert, there's two questions here which you perhaps answered together. One is, is there a requirement for a minister to give a reason for refusal of a community right to buy application? And then another one is, um, under part five, is it the community body that needs to further sustainable development or the third party purchaser that it's sort of nominating? Uh yeah, the Scottish ministers, yes, will uh, give reasons for their refusal, uh, but uh, there's no, I don't think there's anything uh, expressly in the Act which says that they are required to give reasons, but, when, uh, but they will give reasons for uh, not accepting uh, the application uh, because they've got to justify their decision. Um, and that's obviously then what gives you your right of appeal. Uh, because you then can then look at the reasons and decide whether you wish to appeal or not. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the second question? Uh, the second question was uh, whether if the community body is not is transferring to a third party, oh, yeah. it's a third party that has to have the sustainable development objective, or the community body, or, or indeed both. Well, it, well, the it, the third party, it's who, whoever is going to be doing the uh, whoever is going to be actually acquiring the land so it could it could be the community it could be a community body but it could be this nominated third party uh, body uh, but uh, whichever one of them it is that's actually going to acquire the land ultimately they are the ones that have to have the sustainable development uh, proposal um, which they intend to implement. There's a quite interesting question here about unknown land and I remember and I'm sure Mark will remember from our careers many years ago in local government that you get funny bits of land and no one knows who they own it. So if you're trying to do a community body, especially in urban areas, community tra transfer and you don't know who owns it, how does that work uh, in section, I think section 37 was raised by the question. Uh, who do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I want Robert to ask the question. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I have not actually come personally come across that in operation. Um, I have come across other situations where landowners haven't been uh, identified um, uh, for, as you say, odd wee parcels uh, of uh, land. So um, I think. Uh, my, my guess would be that um, you would simply um, put in your application form um, the evidence of what it is that you've done in order to try and trace who the owner is. Um, and if the owner is turns out to be untraceable, uh, it may be that there is no actual owner left. Um, I just remember that years ago, I remember around here in Edinburgh, there was a shop that was the owner had disappeared completely and it leaked and it had wet rot and everything. It strikes me this may be a way to uh, to, to, to acquire it um, uh, in the future uh, if someone could identify a community interest and a community group who cared about some sustainable purpose. Yes, I mean, um, your, your specific example also brings in, for example, the uh, abandoned or uh, derelict land uh, right to buy uh, possibility as well. But if we're taking it as just uh, the general community right to buy, and it turns out that there is a parcel of land um, that the community is interested in buying and they just cannot find an owner for it, um, then the, most, the best they can do is simply um, demonst demonstrate to the Scottish ministers that there is actually nobody 
with an identifiable interest in that land um, and do their do their best to persuade the Scottish ministers that all efforts that are possible to identify somebody have been exhausted. Well, we received any questions about some questions by email. Um, one of them we talked about this earlier was how these rules interface with sort of the general principles of Scots law um, and we were sort of talking discussing before we started about are there areas where you can see a lack of connection between what's being provided for in these two acts these acts and other principles of, of property law or, or, or private law rights or, or is it all going to be swimmingly and there'll be no litigation at all well bear in mind of course that uh, this uh, act only applies to asset transfers from relevant authorities which are public bodies so if there had been any intent intention in the act to allow asset transfers over private property, uh, then no doubt one would have issues about uh, human rights, uh, rights of private property. Equally, if the Scottish government had tried to uh, allow asset transfers to be made requests uh, over UK government uh, property, which is not with obviously within the, well, not property, but function of UK government, not within the uh, remit of the Scottish uh, Parliament, the Scottish government, then one can imagine that there might be issues of that nature. But I think because this is very much focused on uh, asset transfer requests to Scottish public bodies, I don't think there's any particular uh, issues of principle which apply. No doubt there'll be issues about how it's uh, applied in practice, which will be the subject of a review or litigation in the future. But I think uh, it's, uh, it's very much within the uh, uh, general uh, um, scheme of uh, Scottish uh, private law and property. The other question, question, we have a very long question from, uh, in fact, from the uh, community ownership support service team themselves, um, which, which you've, you've both got copies of this in an email from last week. Um, it relates to the interface of the common good land. Do any of you, particularly uh, Mark, do you want to um, pick up this in respect of common good land or do you want to neatly segue it on to the seminars well, next week that my, our colleagues are dealing with uh, well, on the end? Yeah. I mean, as I said in my talk, the guidance uh, is clear that uh, common good property in principle is subject to the uh, provisions of the Act. Uh, and the question which we were asked was concerned about an apparent uh, delay in dealing with an application for, a common, uh, for an asset transfer in respect of common good land. Uh, the Act does include provisions that if a decision is not taken within a certain period, six months from the validation date, as we uh, uh, with the, de the definition, uh, then there is then a right of appeal or review. So the obvious uh, response to a query about uh, someone who uh, uh, finds their application is not dealt with by the body to whom an application is made is they can still then regard that as not being made, and so an application can be reviewed, decision can be taken. Uh, but the general principle is that if it is common good property, then an application can be made. Uh, and uh, although dealing with it, in dealing with it, your authority concern has to go through the procedures which apply to any application to acquire common good property uh, or dispose of common good property, but in principle, the application can still be made. Thank you. There's, there's a question here from John Porteous about crofting community right to buy. Robert, do you want to pick this up or? Um, yes. I, again, I think the short answer to that is. Uh, the, the, the questioner is correct um, that uh, under the crofting community right to buy, um, the right uh, essentially is to crofting tenants, people who live in crofting townships, um, but uh, they've got to be uh, either uh, on, uh, if they're not uh, crofters themselves, um, the, then they've got to be living on property which is uh, immediately adjacent to um, the, the crofting property contiguous with it um, or, or, the, or, or the common grazing and if they happen to be in a crofting uh, community uh, but uh, not uh, on uh, immediately adjacent land to croft land then they, are, they don't have the right to vote is my understanding. Thank you. And we've got a long question here uh, from our colleague, um, Alistair Burnett. So, um, Robert, do you want to read it out and see if you have a good answer? Mark was also thinking about answering it, so I'll take questions, answers from either of you. 
Uh, right, I'll just call the question up. Um, yes, this is. Uh, uh, yeah, ma, ma, yes, ma, Lord ma, Malcolm. Uh, in, Can you read the question? Because the, the audience can't see the question. So, right. Uh, uh, do you think the approach of the sheriffs in the Home Hill and Coastal Regeneration case to the appeals against refusal of registration are correct, given the obiter comment of Lord Malcolm at paragraph 84 of the Peer Crofters against Scottish Ministers case that suggests that the appeal uh, under section 61 of the Act is not restricted to issues of law uh, or uh, judicial review principles? Uh, and uh, I think that Lord Malcolm is was an error in that, um, uh, and uh, that the sheriffs uh, are correct. Uh, my recollection is that uh, in Lord Malcolm's comments, he did say something about uh, the annotations to the uh, act uh, and a comment by the annotator saying that. Uh, the court was uh, unlikely to um, uh, challenge the discretionary decision of the Scottish ministers. Uh, and the fact is that uh, it is a discretionary decision. Um, so, uh, and, and your right of appeal is, a, is an appeal against um, the decision of the, of the ministers. Uh, so, it seems to me that, uh, you know, ha having a right of appeal where uh, it's on the merits and you're rerunning the whole issue um, and uh, then, uh, for example, have the opportunity of putting forward potentially further evidence that wasn't before the Scottish Ministers, um, it was not uh, what was intended by the legislation. Um, obviously, if the Scottish ministers have done something wrong by ignoring evidence that was put before them, um, uh, or uh, have uh, somehow or other misconstrued the evidence that's been put before them, then um, they have they can be shown to have erred uh, as a matter of law. Uh, but uh, yeah, so in in short, I think the sheriffs were correct. Lord Malcolm's comments. Um, Incorrect. Mark, do you want to disagree with that? Well, I tend to agree with Robert's analysis, but I also know that it wasn't actually Lord Malcolm's over the comments. So uh, I think possibly this is one thing which uh, we uh, might turn to come, come back to. But uh, I mean, just on the question of asset transfer, of course, there is, of course, no appeal to a sheriff uh, in that process. Uh, it's all a review and appeal process within the authorities and within to the Scottish Government, and it's open. Uh, as far as asset transfer scheme is concerned, beyond that review and appeal process, then it is only by judicial review uh, that one can challenge the ultimate decision of the Scottish Government when it comes to asset transfer. So, Robert, we've got an observation here for, by Elspeth Matheson that a community can be defined by a community council boundary as well as a postcode. So, I suppose that would give an extra level of fidelity in some places. Uh, right, sorry. Right, yeah, just finding that, yes, right. Uh, okay, fair, fair, fair enough, yep. Yeah. Uh, but it does occur to me that you can add but, together a lot of very small postcode sectors to make your map. You don't have to just- Well, well you're, well, you're, I mean, you're, you're, yes, I mean, you're, um, your community council, I suppose the point is, it's, it's a sort of geographic area. Um, and your, and your, uh, I think the, as, uh, you're, you can be a community uh, which uh, is within a, a, a postcode area or you can be a community which covers more than one postcode area. Um, you don't have to cover the whole of the postcode area. Um, you, you're simply referring to the postcode area that you cover and your community council boundary, of course, um, will reflect um, it in itself uh, also re reflects um, you know, postcodes uh, in a practical sense. 
Right, now we've got a few other observations here. Um, so the one that I thought was interesting is, there's an anonymous question here, SKIOs and community right to buy. Uh, can any SKIO make an application or does it have to be a community-based organization? I suppose it could be the question I was thinking about a SKIO that already exists uh, before someone comes up with the idea of a community right to buy application. Uh, again, um, I've not, ex I can't remember it express expressly looking at that. My Again, my recollection of the um, uh, regulations are that uh, your skill has to uh, be defined by reference to the community. Or, so um, if you've already got a skill established, um, which is a community body or, or uh, uh, so refers to a community area, uh, then you're fine. Um, if you're setting up your new skill, then your new skill uh, would have to um, define its community um, uh, th that, it, that it relates to. Um, and I think that is uh, a requirement um, for the a skill body that wants to be the community body. We've got a final question, which I thought was quite interesting for Mark. So I suppose it's imagining if you had a normal private bargain between a public sector body and somebody else and they're disposing of a piece of property, do they or can they protect themselves in their missives from another community body turning up and making a, as it were, a counter bid? Is there any way you can protect yourself against this happening if you're already transferring to a community body? Well, as I read it, if uh, if there is a private bargain process going uh, underway, then once this gets to the stage of uh, entering into negotiations, which is not defined, uh, unfortunately, but once it gets to that stage, um, then although an asset transfer request can be made by another community body, then there's no prohibition on disposing of the asset concern. So um, obviously one would need to look carefully at the circumstances, the individual circumstances. It doesn't look to me as you need to do anything special in the missus if you reach the stage where we be regarded as entering into negotiations. And presumably by this stage, you must, you'll probably be at this stage in the process. I should say though, that if you have a situation where there are different asset transfer requests coming in, so you have one asset transfer request from one organisation and then somebody else down the line puts another request and so on. There are provisions or recommendations and the guidance for how these should uh, interplay and how they should be dealt with if there's a request put in for the same uh, property again in the future after uh, uh, one transfer request has been uh, uh, refused. But in a situation like this, and I think the protection is simply the protection that once negotiations have been entered into, then there is no general uh, uh, restriction on disposal. So uh, I think probably nothing special in this case, but obviously one would need to look at the case in detail to be absolutely certain about that. Right, well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending um, and for all the wonderful questions. And thank you, Robert and Mark, for their presentations. And we just remind you that the slides will be sent to everyone who signed up later on today. Uh, there is an event uh, next week on the 18th uh, dealing with um, uh, on sort of common good land and we'll be hearing from Scott Blair and Dennis Garrity on that if we're changed by, chaired by James Finley QC. And I think unless um, I receive, oh yes, and also in future events will be listed both on our website and in Scottish Legal News. So please do look out for them. Uh, and if you have particular requests of things you'd like us to consider an event, do let Emma Caskey Potter at Terra Firma Chambers know. But thank you so much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, at least we haven't got to go out into what turns out to be horrible weather here in Edinburgh, and we're all already in, in our homes. But hopefully see you in, re in the real world at some point. Thank you very much. <laughs>